Welcome to the future, guys. We are live. So sorry for the delays. You know how it is. We got to make sure everybody looks good and we got a really complicated setup. For today's episode, I'm super excited because who's going to be on the show today? James Levy is going to be on the show. He's going to do some style frame magic, some design, and some live work with Photoshop. Now, before we get to him, we're going to say hello to the Dream Team. Hey, guys, what's going on? Hey. Whoa. Hey, Chris. Wait a minute. You don't look like the normal crew. Who we got going on here? Introduce yourselves, you guys. Hi. Um. <laughs> <laughs> He's not used to it. During the headline. Come on, man. Totally. It's been Come a on, while. Greg. <laughs> Step up, dude. Step up. Hey, I'm Greg Gunn. I, I, I've missed you, and uh, I'm back. <laughs> you are back. <laughs> and you're madder than hell. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Okay. What's and up? then you guys know Matthew. Yep. Matthew, what's up? What's up, guys? Here again. You, yes, this you time are. I'm on this side of the room. So you are on this side of the room. I'm filling Aaron's room, I guess, with Molly. I'm Molly. Right You're Molly. Oh, Molly. Today. I'm Molly right now. You're Molly. Yeah, uh, Not as good looking though. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair's a little shorter, Molly. Okay. And then of course we have Erica, who's been doing Hello. a fantastic job cutting our show. Oh, fantastic. You. Love it. And why are Greg and Matthew here? Greg and Matthew are here because they're both creative directors, and we're doing motion graphic specific content. And so of course it's natural that they be here. We're going to see James do his thing in a little bit. And before we do that, you guys, let's roll the titles. You know what we're going to do? Let's just cut to James so you guys can see what he looks like because I don't have a great picture of him. Let's see him on the screen any minute. Now there he is. There's James. James has been very gracious to agree to come in to do this demo with us. He's been up all night for days working on this demo. Okay, so those of you guys that don't know who James is, I'm going to show you a little bit of his work. He does gorgeous work. So let's step through this real quick, and then we're going to get into this. Ready? So look at this work, you guys. Now, James can't see this, but he submitted a bunch of things for me to share with you guys. So I'm going to step through this. Incredible work. Mostly done in Photoshop. Is that right, James? It's all done in Photoshop. All done in Photoshop. And do you do any 3D work? No. So this is all photo compositing, hand painting done in Photoshop. Yes. Right. Some of you guys that use Photoshop, there's in our industry will say like you're painting frames. And it's kind of very much like painting, but it's photo real yeah. for the most part, right? Yeah. Okay, so he's gonna show us a demo project in a little bit. Just so I wanna whet your appetite a little bit and set the bars to kind of the incredible work he's able to do. So he's stitching together a bunch of assets, recomposing the frame. We're going to get into his story, where he came from, what school he went to, how does one pursue this, what does one do when you're a designer in the, in the motion graphics space. And believe it or not, you can actually have a very great career not doing any 3D work, just stitching together frames like this, helping to find and define the look of a campaign, a commercial, a video or something like that. And you can see there, in, he's working in a variety of styles, something that looks more commercial, like this map that's kind of being folded out of corrugated cardboard with what looks to be like New York City. Looks really cool. There's something like this Svetka cucumber lime beverage. So in, in his work runs the gamut, even into something much, much darker, which you're going to see in a little bit. Or something really cute, like this strawberry colored slug creature looking at some mushrooms. <laughs> this is bizarre. <laughs> it's adorable. He's adorable. He's got a little blue tongue and everything, a little psychedelic. And then there's this thing for, I think, Preacher. Yes, that was Where you flip the house. I oh, wanted right. to open with this image, but I didn't want to alienate our entire audience. <laughs> it's like this antichrist image. Yeah. Beautiful, haunting, very striking. And look at this. He put little birds in the background. And that's a trick that you're going to learn, <laughs> especially if you're doing compositing, to put something moving within a, a big space like this. So that's awesome. Oh, look at this thing. It, it, this thing with the forked tongue and the, the blood spilling and the face peeling off. What's that for, James? Um, that was for the strain. The strain? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, is that the Fox series? Yeah, it was for the Fox series. Beautiful work. I don't think they used it. Okay. It's incredible the amount of art that's created in the pursuit of these uh, packages that we create that never get seen. So I'm glad that you're able to share that with us. Then we end on this last slide, which looks like some kind of fairy tale thing with the road going down there and there's a tree house or something. What was that for? Um, that was a lunchtime sketch. Lunchtime sketch, just for fun. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so now that I've got your interest peaked here, let's jump into it. Let's do a demo. So James, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Absolutely. And while James is working, uh, I'll be talking to him, asking him questions, and I'm sure Matthew and Greg will do the same. So let's jump into it. What do, what do you got planned for us today, man? Okay, so 
I was having some difficulty figuring out what I would do for a demo, but I ended up making a frame and just kind of, I didn't have any sort of idea what it was going to do. I just started throwing in a bunch of images until I found something that kind of piqued my interest. Okay. And then I just started building it and then I try to backtrack it. So the reason I did that was because normally when you're making a style frame, unlike a painting or a sketch, you normally have a brief. And so it normally is very specific. So sometimes you kind of struggle to make your own version of a style frame without having, you know, an agency board or something. So what I did was I ended up creating kind of like a VisFX looking, you know, 3D looking kind of tribal guy holding a gold heart as a flower. And there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going in it, but I picked certain elements for this to show some, some kind of, some sort of convention of how you would build one of these. Because there is no convention to build one. Everyone's different. Mm. Because everything, you know, every kind of concept is completely different. And something might be Paisley, something might be Photocomp. So, okay. You know, before we do this, our audience is saying our mic levels are a little low. Erica, are you seeing those comments? We'll hang tight for just a brief second, you guys, <laughs> while we work on the audio level. One comment from uh, Jess online. Uh, what did she say? Based off of the last image that you showed, James, she's like, gosh, how long are your lunch breaks? <laughs> <laughs> or how fast can a man work? Yeah, right. right? Yeah. And well, you, when you become a professional like you are, you can bang out ideas really fast. Right. Well, I mean, it, it sometimes depends on, you know, what you're trying to achieve in your image like it's everything's based off photos that you find and then you kind of touch them up mm -hmm. you know so sometimes i find fantastic photos and i do very little stitching mm -hmm. together and so sometimes a star frame can take 30 minutes and then there are times where i'll be working on one frame for a client for two three days right that makes a lot of sense so what you're saying is like good assets in good product out so oh you my have god to have great yeah assets to work with yeah i mean I'll look in the camera to say this, but for anyone that's a student or starting to get into this world, like buy a hard drive and start creating an asset library. You know, when you're searching Pinterest, Google, whatever it is that where you find your imagery, start categorizing things. Because when you're working with a client and especially in motion graphics, where sometimes you get the same subject come up a lot, like you may do uh, three car commercials in a month, they sort of want sometimes the same stuff. So it's being able to be like, oh, you want to, a background in a snow environment and you can go into your landscapes, mountains, snow mountains, and you have everything there. And so once you have your asset library, you can obviously you'll use new assets, but you'll always have like your favorites that pop up a lot, right. you know, that's, that's a great piece of advice, guys, write this down, start building up an asset library. And the thing about the asset library, it's an investment in your future. The, the more time that over time you build it up and it gets bigger and better yeah. and more refined and then you start adding elements that you shoot or capture yourself or generate absolutely and it starts to get better and better and it just becomes more valuable over time yeah i've been in industry for a little bit so have you so i imagine your asset library is ginormous as is mine yeah it gets it almost <laughs> takes over you know so you have to <laughs> you have to back it up all the time and right you know i've started to use the cloud and start mm -hmm. use pinterest and stuff but um yeah, I still have my I still have my old drive from eight years ago. It's like taped together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time every time I hear it start to make a funny noise, I run out to Best Buy and buy a new one. And that's how you do it. Huh? Sit there with my fingers crossed, hoping that it transfers over. Okay, let's dive in. Show cool. people. Let's let's do it. Let's jump into the screen. You got. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know why it's not working. All right, you guys. 
kind of chill. Radiant, and then I darkened it because I knew this frame was gonna have you know a heavy light source. I decided that the light source was gonna come from the top, and I blurred it. And this is what I just decided to start with, knowing fu fully well that this gradient that I always start with changes. Like it's almost like me putting down like a wash. I see what you're doing. You're just laying down the background vibe. Yeah. Okay. You've got to put a first step somewhere, and so right. mine's always just a gradient. Okay, beautiful. Um, so what I did was I actually went ahead and I found, I was, you know, I didn't know what I was going to make and I decided just to have a look around, see if I could find something weird. And I found this and I thought this was rad. So is this a CG model? Um, I just found it online. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming it's a CG model. Actually it's uh no, I think it's a, I think it's a person. I don't know. That looks like. 3D to me. It looks yeah. a little 3 d so creepy. Well, I found it. You found it. <laughs> and I was very excited about it. <laughs> so I found it. And normally, like, the main thing that I always focus on when working on style frames is, you know, it's a lot of cutting out. And I make sure that my elements are cut out really well. Mm -hmm. Like, as long as your elements are cut out well and you light things well, at the bare bone, your frame's going to look really good. So how I do it is I do it a very weird, non-traditional way is I go ahead, I have another version of it, where I take my erase tool. Um, yeah, there you go. I take my erase tool and I just come around the whole object like this. You know, mm -hmm. I just, and I, and I do it because I want to match the blur of things. Like sometimes the edges of things aren't sharp. So it looks really weird if you have an, an object that doesn't, has, has, a, has a kind of blurry, fluffy, edge and you go in and you use like a lasso tool so i kind of go ahead and match it so almost like i have it here so if i so are you painting in the layer mask I'm a, yeah i'm erasing i'm erasing away from it so let me just so yeah so i come in here and i make a mask and i just quickly go around the whole thing with my eraser tool and i just make sure that you know and i I just kind of do that. Mm -hmm. And once I have that, once I have that like that, I then take the lasso tool and then I just steamroll around you it. You garbage map the rest. Yeah. Okay. And so it, you know, ends up looking like that. And I make sure that I don't, I don't do anything until my, my, my first image is really like clean. And I go in and I check it. I even put like a green background behind it, which is always in my, it's always here just to double check that everything's clean. Um, so once I get that image, especially if I'm doing a personal frame, like that one that you pointed out with the house, now I'm getting an idea of what I want this to look like. So I thought it'd be kind of interesting to have this guy standing in like a fire blazed environment. And I thought it'd be really cool to have, I knew that the flower was gonna change. I didn't want it to be a rose. Um, and I didn't quite yet know what that was gonna be. So what I did was, um, I duplicated the image just to darken and I, I erased some areas where, you know, they have some light already on it. So like on the forehead here, because mm -hmm. the light's coming down, just kind of hitting it and keeping the interesting areas. And then, um, I just quickly 
duplicated this, I kind of just covered this for a second because I knew this was going to go. Okay. And all I did with that was, you know, I, I came into my original image and I grabbed this was right by it, copied it, put it over like so. You do like a skin graph. Yeah, <laughs> and I just and, and and at this point, it's you know I'm not invest, I'm not committed to anything. Uh huh. So it's just sort of for me, you know, just to say, all right, this is not going to be there, and I come back and address it later if I find something that's going to go there. Okay. Um. Anyway, once I treated that. You know, I, I link the la the layers together. I keep the ones that I have prior so I can go back. Mm -hmm. But for the purpose of working, I just, I, I've already decided I'm liking where this is. So this is its one layer. And uh, yeah. So once I had this, I was like, okay, I'm going to have this thing. Now I was thinking about the background. I was like, I want it to be like a fire world. So again, I just, I just went online and, and I found this. Not that this was what I wanted it to be like, but I liked I liked the heat, the temperature. I liked that it was pretty ambiguous. And then what I did was, was I went ahead, I duplicated it. And I went to, um, I went to blur and this guy here, which I love, uh, Gaussian the, blur, the Gaussian blur. Mm -hmm. And I just moved it to 19. So you're doing that kind of like for color and the, the general shape? Yeah, just knowing that, you know, I'm going to have some light behind him. It's going to strengthen his silhouette. Um, I still don't know. Like, I mean, again, this whole demo was me just being like, where am I going to take this? Like, it's just a, like a, a photo comping journey that I was going on. You know, mm -hmm. I was like, no idea what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So I blurred it out. I think I matched it. Yeah. So I blurred it out like this and it just kind of gave, it gave me the temperature. It just kind of gave me kind of like the mood. I was like, right, so this is what's gonna happen. Um, once I got to that, then I decided to start tweaking in here and being like, okay, so what is this guy's story? You know, you know, wh what are we trying to, what are we trying to say with this cat? So the first thing I did was I decided that it was time for me to figure out what was gonna be here. And I thought, how cool would it be to have a heart? Cause it's right over his heart. So where's my heart? My heart is right. Sorry. All right. Let me see here. There it go. So this was this was the heart that I had. Um, I think I saved that layer before. Well, where'd that heart come from? It's just stuff I find like in my you know online, just finding stuff. You have to search your images like a like a child. <laughs> like I type in gold heart, and you'd be surprised what comes up. A gold heart comes up. I mean, yeah, like hundreds <laughs> of them. You know, you. I mean, right. again, with photo comping. A lot of times, and this is, this is actually where photo comping can be a little bit limiting is you are quite beholden to images that you find mm -hmm. unless you're painting it or it's a painted style frame, you're limited. So oftentimes, I mean, I searched for a gold heart for about 20 minutes and then I was like, this one's great. So being aware that it might belong to someone. Sure. <laughs> so, you know. Well, this is for just the sake of a demo. This is not for commercial project. No, You're not trying to sell this piece at all. I just want to no. be clear about that, you guys. No, yeah, no. I would, I, you know, anytime I'm working on anything for a client, um, I very rarely take things off Google anymore. I used to do that search, and mm -hmm. I don't take anything off Pinterest. I actually, I pay for some a lot of different stock accounts because if I'm doing professional work, I rather license it and play with those, and that way I know that everything's all good right um so once i've got this heart i wanted to match it to this light source so i duplicated it mm -hmm. and then i put a shadow pass on it now how i did that was i'll t i'll delete these and i'll do it for you guys i always i mean if there's something that has a strong you know sense of light in it already i'll always duplicate it and multiply it and go ahead and just a race where the light's hitting it and that way i'm just making it you know just a little bit more contrasty mm -hmm. um i link it to it and then i really like what's happening here with the core shadow so i'm going to create another layer hit that color here and with my brush just 
Is this layer a multiply layer now? Yeah, it's just a multiply okay. layer. And that way I can see where it's sitting and I can then go and erase. Um, I really, I always use these airbrushes. I, I know there's loads of brushes that people can use for painting and, but whenever I'm just cutting out photos and lighting them, I normally take the 30 brush. <coughs> I turn everything off apart from the transfer and I have pen pressure and pen pressure there. And that way you've just got, you've got this really nice kind of brush and if, if you're making it if you make it really big it kind of just bleeds into everything you know and the smaller it gets the sharper you can make it right <clears throat> um i don't know if this is for any other reason than this is just the brush i've been using since i graduated and i'm i'm very used to it and i've made it work i just want to mention something because yusuf ali's watching this it's like it's crazy that the pros still use very basic methods in photoshop and yeah. we've discovered this with orlando and you it's not really all the latest tricks and, and, and <laughs> tools and plugins. It's just no. fundamental techniques and painting and building things up. Yeah. So I just want to address that because, well, of course, our audience is very educated. They're like, oh, use this key or spot healing brush. And there's lots of tools you can use. Yes. But yeah. just stay with the concept, you guys. Use whatever tools you want, ultimately. Well, I tell my students, you know, they always want me to do demos on how do you, how do you make this or how do you render this and how do you paint this? And I always tell them if I do a demo, I give them a warning. I'm like, listen, don't look at what I'm doing <laughs> because some of the things that I'm doing are just, you know, some other professionals would look at them and be like, why are you doing it that way? It's just, it's such a, it's such an easy program. It's not very big, especially compared to these 3D programs that you can have trial and error. And there's a hundred different ways to do the same thing, mm -hmm. which whatever way works for you, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, once I get that, then I went back here and I gave this a little shadow behind here just to make this pop. And um, this is kind of where I was like, once I got to this point, this is when I, you know, I took a little break and went, left the machine for a minute and came back and was kind of excited. Um, so now I just started problem solving and I was like, well, what can we do to enhance this? And one of the things was I didn't want this gold heart to sit on this boring green um, stem so I found this guy again just searching looking for images I think this was gold branch <laughs> yeah what was the search for this one I think so gold leaf 3d gold leaf 3d <laughs> yeah okay. just absolute hack hack searches <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah and I left this big here just to show you that you know I came in here and everything's cut out really nice um, just made sure that, I mean that's more important to me making sure all my elements are cut out really clean um, because the reason I I'm a big a big um, a big fan of doing that is because when you're working on a job for a client there has to be kind of levels to what you're going to deliver to them you know like if if they were to say to me James we want you know this weird 3d guy holding a gold heart as long as I get that done at the bare minimum I'm going to hit the mark not to say that that's where I want to stop it but there has to be like a bare minimum for me and right. for the client and then after that you know if you run out of time you keep adding all the the bits and bobs to it at least you've done the assignment which mm -hmm. is so important because people sometimes just don't hit that assignment and then the, your client doesn't want to pay you so once i have this guy here i was going to bring it in here and just start playing around with how that could look so Lay this in first. And while you do that, I'm going to adjust your mic for you, okay? You keep working. Go on, man. Okay. Make sure it's pointing at your mic. There we go. Awesome. Um, got this guy down here, and now I know this background here has to go away. So I'm going to go back to my, my character, and I'm just going to grab a big chunk of him there. And just put it behind where the green leaf is like that because I'm gonna put so much stuff in front of it that it doesn't matter if it doesn't completely doesn't need to be perfect at this point in time no because no one's gonna look at the image and be like wait did you just paint that black pine there because there's gonna be so much stuff in front of it mm -hmm. so once I got my leaf my stem um, I'm liking what's happening with it. I'm actually going to duplicate it because I want to bring it a little bit further down. I'm going to 
duplicate it again. Ooh. Make it a bit smaller, just to maybe make it more of an interesting branch. Maybe there's two, but I don't want it to get repetitive, so I'll cut this bit out here. Hey, Matt and Greg, while you guys are watching this, you guys do a lot of style frames and painting boards. Mm -hmm. How does this process compare to something that you guys do? Very similar. Yeah. <laughs> For me, it's very similar. And I think one thing that James had brought up earlier, which is great, is, yeah, you could spend an eternity painting one perfect frame, but in reality, uh, there's a time constraint. So if we have a pitch due on Monday, we have four days left to do it. It's like, okay, I need to identify these three or four key moments by then. How do I budget my time so that I have something viable that communicates what I want the creative director to communicate and what I feel like the client is going to respond to. So I think where pros and amateurs uh, uh, differ is that amateurs, yes, they can make great stuff and maybe they're still learning how to improve that speed. But where pros are really great is they understand that time is a huge component. Right. So they ask, OK, well, how long do I have for this? It's like, how much are you expecting so that by the end of this, I'm working at the pace like, OK, I could only spend four hours on each frame or I could only spend eight hours on each frame so I know exactly how to budget my time and at the end everything's going to look consistent to each other and uh, at the end it's like everybody's going to be <coughs> happy with what we're getting super so once I once I've decided that this is where I want this stem to be I duplicated it and put it in this file here so I have it but the one I'm going to work on I'm just going to I'm just going to close it so I don't have thousands and thousands of layers. You're going to merge the layers together? Yeah, I merge yeah. them together here, but I have them all separate underneath here. So if I have to change them for some reason. Oh, so you're keeping all your raw assets available to you in case you got to do something different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. but so It's I, not destructive that way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I learned the hard way very early on in my career to, if you ever cut things out, have a mask. Because if you don't and you change it, then it's a whole lot of trouble. So once I've got that, I want the fingers to kind of feel like it's, you know, wrapping around them. So I'm, I'm, I change the opacity here and on my mask, I go ahead and I just. Okay. Now while you do that and you're cutting him out, <clears throat> I'm sorry, putting the hand in front of him, basically create that illusion. There's a couple of questions coming in and people are getting a little feisty on online. <clears throat> so Puya is asking. In the super chat question here, are you worried about copyright and other others' images? I'm going to answer that, and then I'd love to hear what Matthew, Greg, and, and James has to say about that. So, oftentimes, what we're doing is we're we're creating a concept not for sale. We're just trying to quickly articulate the general look, feel, and communicate an idea. And the reason why we typically can do this without getting sued or worried about copyright issues is, should the client approve this, we would then go and build 3D assets or go do a photo shoot and do all these kinds of things. So we're stitching together things to just make an idea. That's really all it's about. Now, having said that though, if you can, if you have your own assets or you're using a stock photography site and there's so many that are out there that you can use, then you're gonna be even better uh, in terms of being protected from being sued. It does come into play sometimes when the artist sees this work on your website and they flip out because maybe you haven't altered it enough or uh, perhaps you're presenting in a way that they don't want it seen. So typically they'll send you a cease and desist and say, can you take that image off? And of course you always oblige. Yeah. Has I, that I, ever happened to you? I, I, I know because I don't ever put work on my website that belongs to other people. I'm, I'm really against using other people's work. Like with my students, they'll pull things off Pinterest. And I'm like, you cannot do that because that's someone's work. Um, all these images that I find, like especially for print or for, you know, I pay for them. I pay for them on sh um, stock imagery or mm -hmm. I get permission. Um, but to your point, which is really interesting, a lot of times when you're, when you're pitching, it's internal. So it's right. just for this. So basically it's like for 12 people to see basically. So basically what that means is, sorry, <clears throat> if I get hired at a studio and they want to pitch an idea to their client, Mm -hmm. We just have to win the job because there might be three or four other studios trying to bid for that work. So we'll pull a bunch of stuff on the internet just to say, hey, this is what we're going to make if you hire us. And no one ever sees that. That just stays between us. And, you know, even in some of the reference books that we send to a client, 
we'll just pull people's work. That's just the nature of the business. But if that job wins, then none of those frames go online. No one can see them. And everyone creates all the assets from scratch. Right. So, yeah. Matthew and Greg, you guys want to jump in there? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, James really said it best. You know, that, that kind of initial thinking up front, um, you have very limited time to communicate an idea. So you're like, oh, it's like Independence Day meets uh, a rom-com or something. You, you want to quickly <laughs> I, identify something someone's familiar with mm -hmm. and, and show it to them as fast as you can uh, to win the job, to take it. And then um, when you actually produce the work, yeah, I'm, I'm going to hire an actor, or build a model in CG of someone holding that, that stem like that. You know, you're, I'm not just going to use the thing I found online. Right. And, and I think to that point, too, there's some confusion on here because uh, we use the term motion designer mm. and people think that, oh, James is not an animator. I don't, I don't get it. I'm confused. Well, the fact here in, in our industry is that there are people who do both, definitely who design and animate. Mm -hmm. But in our industry, because there's so much talent here and we have such big teams that we collaborate with, sometimes there's people who are just exclusively designers. All they do is create these beautiful frames to help us either sell the idea through or to create some key moments that the animators could use as a guide to understand this is what it has to look like when it's all animated and composited in the end. So I think that's where there's some... Uh, confusion from some of the audience where they don't understand the term motion designer doesn't mean that you have to animate you could exclusively just be making stills for the sake of um, painting a picture of what it's going to look like and you collaborate on a much bigger team perfect yeah it's also i was actually going to say that oftentimes when you get hired to do this kind of stuff for pitching work you have three days you know there's times where i'll get hired i've been hired by studios and they're like james we have today to get five images together. And um, yeah, I just get it done for the studio. And if you do want to show that work on your website, then you have to go back into the frame and redo it and place it and be respectful of anyone else. But I would say if you want to be safe, don't don't take reference, don't use assets that someone else's work. Like just avoid that. It's, for the long run, it will be better. Super. Okay, now I noticed uh, since we cut away for minute here you've added some kind of cracks or fissures within the body yeah where did that asset come from what are you trying to do here talk us through that process um so this was just <clears throat> basically it was just some flames that i found and uh i just started warping them and color correcting them and crunching them and um i put them on a black background and screen them okay so they kind of you know are here and um once i get them done i you know i, I haven't really decided if i like like them there if they're working there i like the ones on the neck i like this around here i don't think it's needed there and then once i do that i'm going to color correct it to make it feel like it's gold so i'm going to select this link it just go to colorize and uh just colorize it like this you paint it on top of your fire element and turn your brush into colorize mm-hmm I don't know that technique. That's pretty cool. Oh, you mean to to so if you if you unhinge it, it's just like that. So. Oh, you linked it to it. Yeah, I linked okay. it to it. So. And then the other one was on a screen. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> screen it, and then. So you turn the layer the layer transfer mode to colorize. Yeah. You just painted with that same gold color. I th yes. Okay. I think I did something wrong here. It was working before, yeah. before I asked my question. Boom, there it goes. Yeah. Okay. And then you were talking about warping before. Were you warping the fire element to sort of match the volume of the kind of shape of the body? So basically, like, so say here, if I was to paint like a fire element or just say I was going to paint. Can you take a little piece and just do it? Yeah, drop absolutely. In a, drop in a little piece. Well, maybe hide this layer and then drop in some fire elements and show people how you do it. Yeah, let me go. You know what? I'm going to pull one off the internet right now. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Live dangerously. Go on the internet. <laughs> so you just search for fire. And then Firefox comes up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot of references now. Thanks to all the fires in California. Okay, so like something like this. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just. Uh, Let's take that. Let's use that. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, that was a big file. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. You get a lot of a lot of imagery on Google. Mm -hmm. um, so I might take this, bring it down to scale, make this. Okay, this is going to work nice here. Right. And I'm going to screen it just so I can see where I'm at. Okay. Once I do that, see how there's this white box around it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to my levels. I'm just going to crunch it a bit to get rid of it. See how I've got this big bounding box around it. I don't want that because it's going to make warping harder. So okay. I'm just going to come. You need to cut a quick garbage mat. Yeah. You call them garbage mats? That's cool. Yeah, it's from, from compositing. It's a rough mat. I see. Before you do the refined stuff. Then you invert your selection, you delete the rest. Yeah. Okay. So now see how the bounding box is smaller. Mm -hmm. So then I go mm. to warp. And I'll just start. You're making it a thinner thing and kind of transforming the original element so it's not as recognizable as what it was. Well, I mean, I'm not doing it because of it being recognizable. Like, I mean, if anyone is going to be like, hey, that's my No, I don't mean frame. it like that. I mean, that it's but, yeah. not so obvious that you pulled it from a burning log. Right, right. It's almost something that you painted. Right, exactly. Not from a copyright thing. I think we're over that, you guys. Everybody's <laughs> worried about copyright. Let's get over that. <clears throat> <laughs> some some goofballs like that's my fire pick I'm gonna sue you for money <laughs> <coughs> come get yeah, me sure come get him he's on a plane to the UK pretty soon so you guys relax you, be, you better be careful man uh, this guy trains jujitsu man he won't choke you out <laughs> <laughs> let's not even go there you guys let's not go there okay so that's what he did he pulled an element he quickly garbage matted out he adjusted the levels and he warped it kind of just to create an interesting shape right I mean, okay. obviously, it's not the same as my source image. Yeah, your source is much better. Yeah, because I, I, you know, I took some time to find right. it. But saying that, I could still, if I wanted to make that, if I had to match this real fast. <clears throat> sorry, guys, I'm just getting over a cold, so you and me both. It's hard to talk. I would maybe make it thinner like this. I could go to my smudge tool here, maybe. I knew this is coming. Here it comes. Smudge it up. So you're trying to create more variation in the shape because the other element has kind of an, uh, a randomness to it. Right. So I could come in and just... Just to break up that line. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. You guys get the idea. Yeah, you know, you just... These elements take time to, to build. Like I prepped, right. I prepped these a lot before the thing because I didn't know how much time we would have to... Sure. I want to make one quick comment here. You notice how he adjusted that branch to make it longer because it, it terminated in a funny way. And then he made one of the, the leaves kind of break through the, the forefinger and the middle finger or whatever that is. And put a shadow behind uh, it. And put a shadow so that it feels much more <coughs> three-dimensional. So even though elements are two-dimensional in nature, creating the illusion of 3D that it protrudes past and wraps around the finger, it creates a really nice look. Yeah, and you could do that in other parts of the image as well. If you think, if you think the image is starting to get you know, a little static, you know, I can maybe say, okay, you know, I want to use this guy again somewhere. Maybe I duplicate it. Maybe I want to have, you know, a branch, one of these kind of like almost like this, make it smaller. Not saying that I would do this because I kind of like just where it's at, but anytime you get a place here, you can go ahead and have it one sticking out there. Maybe one's going behind it. You know? Above and below. That's what you're talking about, right? There's, yeah. There's a leaf that's above something and something that gets cut behind it. Absolutely. You know, it just, it's just, it then just, you know, supports the fact that this thing is dimensional. Right. Um, the problem is with a lot of, see there, like it actually feels like it, mm -hmm. even though it, it's like, where the hell is that coming from? This sits nice. Um, it's a problem that happens with a lot of people that do photocomping. If you photocomp, and you aren't aware that things have shadow and light, it just looks flat. And there's nothing worse than flat photocomping, mm -hmm. unless it's intentional. Um, so that's why you always gotta make sure that you can, any any time that you can get some uh, dimension in there, that's what I do. Yeah, so that was the original image I found. Um, that stem we did. Awesome. good tip. Um, okay, so where are we at now? People are calling this the man from hell. The man from hell? I like it. So the next thing I wanted to wait, do... Wait, 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 hold on. Pablo, how dare you say it? That looks like Chris. 
Is that? I, I didn't understand that <laughs> reference, Pablo. You're gonna get booted out of this room. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll give him some glasses. Yeah. Okay. So for me, at this point, like I've hit my basic mark, mm -hmm. right? Here's a guy. He's got a flower it's with his gold heart. Done. Not this is where I want to stop the frame, but now I'm gonna start thinking. Okay. So how can I make this more interesting? The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this face because not much has happened here. There's a lot going on here, and I want to start giving it some some unique stuff. So the first thing I want to do is I kind of want to give this guy or girl some lipstick. You know, I know it sounds a weird place to go, but it does seem like a weird place to go, but I'm, I'm curious to where it goes. But because it's quite tribal, it's quite, you know, it looks like there's some sort of ceremony happening. You know, he's looking up, he's holding this. It's, and I just all massively go to Star Wars. You're going to give him some gold lipstick. Yeah. But like kind of more tribally kind of, so I'm going to start going ahead and just picking the shapes, making sure that I get the contour. Mm -hmm. And again, this is like the first pass of it. I just want to. Get that going like that. It might not, I might not even use this. I just want to see if it works. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to come in here and you know, this is in shadow. So if I left it like this, it looks flat. So I want to just start. back look at it like here's okay this is cool i'm gonna just go ahead and link another layer to it just because for time and then i'm gonna come in here and start it gets a bit darker on the underneath of the lip might get a bit darker in here is your brush 100 percent opaque right now yes okay and i'll do another link layer to it and i might just take the color here so you're doing shadows and highlights Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then just maybe there's some of it where it's faded out. Same token, maybe I might go ahead and just see if I like the look of it. Mm -hmm. Maybe so you're painting along the contours of what you see. Yeah. Yeah Again, it's a lot of trial and error, you know Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't and I kind of just I work like close up and then I look back and I'm like Yeah, so the, I like the lips. I'm not keen on that. It looks like it's got weird eyelashes mm -hmm. So that's a start. So the next thing I was thinking Anytime I get to put a third eye somewhere <laughs> I'm gonna do it <laughs> So I'm going to go back to my image, my original image here. I'm going to Apple copy there. So I've got my guy here. Now, I'm not just going to do it like this because then it's going to one direction. I want it to feel like it's an actual eye. So I'm going to go ahead here. I'm going to cut it. You're going to make it symmetrical? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah maybe put some sort of interesting maybe scale it up a little bit and then just see how there's this shadow from here mm -hmm. i don't want that and i don't need it so i'm going to get rid of it like that just Get rid of it so it feels like the shadow comes from the brow and there's no brow up there so that's why you need to get rid of it yeah and then start like this here and it's kind of creepy you know it's kind of like voodoo yeah it looks really weird shaman something's going on um and then i actually took an i actually had an asset here this eye let's bring it down to where Where did it go? There it goes. So I like this pupil. I thought this was really cool. Again, this is just a image I found online. You're rotating it to try to match the highlight? Or why, why are you rotating the eyeball? 
Um, I'm just rotating just to see if I can fit it in. Like I haven't set on it yet. Like mm -hmm. I'm probably going to end up having it more that side. But once I've got it in on top of the eye like this, you know, this to me is that's like a bad Photoshop job. So I have to go in and make sure it fits. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to erase. So clean up these edges. Got the eye in there. And maybe I might even duplicate it and see if it if it could work in here. I don't think it will work in here. I wanted to keep these maybe. Maybe I have it like that. So it looks like he's still looking. He's like still his eyes are rolled up. Yeah. Head. Yeah. Like that. There we go. Cool. Solid. I don't know. This guy, we might zoom out and this guy might look really goofy. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you never know you'll, you'll see when, you, when we zoom out how long do you spend on something before you say no that's not working and then try something else um, I, I really try not to fall in love with any decision like I'll give it maybe 30 seconds and if it's not working, I'm like, yep, yeah, this is not for me and I'll just get rid of it and look somewhere else. If I really think that it could it could work, I'll give it a couple tries. But like with this, I wouldn't fall in love with it. Like I would I would be like, okay, let's give it pupils, zoom out. If it looks goofy, I'd be like, yeah, forget it. I like it, you know, like that. It looks scarier. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to keep it. I think it's kind of cool. I think you've been pretty consistent in the way you've worked so far. Just work fast, don't worry too much until you really need to, then you'll refine something. You right. start out with the removing the rows all, all the way through the branch and everything else. Just kind of work fast and loose Yeah. and then refine as you need to. Well, the reason I do that is because whenever I get hired on a job, you know, I want to make sure that my client or the director is happy with the direction I'm going in before I commit too much time. So normally by the first day of booking, I'll get one frame out and it might not be completely clean and be like, are we going in the right direction? Mm -hmm. And if we aren't, then back to the drawing board. And if we are, and I can sell that, you know, the style, then I kind of can take my time and be like, okay, I'm going to come back in here. I'm going to clean things up. And now I've got my blueprint for the rest of the frames. But that's my initial thought is just get the idea out. Um, okay, so once we've got this, the lips going um this was an element that i found it was just some splashes i think it was from a campfire and i i color burnt it and i'm just going to screen it put it on top here and i'm gonna just start coloring it to maybe feel like it's coming from the heart and it's working down here it's feeling nice, but I also want to get rid of some of it. I don't want to have it cover the whole heart, so I might delete it just about there. Make sure that anytime you have a highlight, you never want a highlight to be half erased because then it looks gray. Mm -hmm. So you want to get rid of that. And I mean, that's actually where I spend a lot of a lot of time making decisions. Like if I have an element like this and I erase it, all of a sudden that looks messy. So if I want to keep it, I'll keep it in. And if I'm going to get rid of the lights down there, then there can't be any light down there. I'll just, what is happening with that? There we go. And then all of a sudden that looks funky. So I can't do that. So I have to kind of problem solve it. Maybe I can make it smaller. Have it just be in the dark area like that. Maybe even have it. So there's a lot of this goes on with the style frame. A lot of moving things around. Does this work here? Does it not work here? And how how in love are you with, with the element? Can you say, you know what? This is taking away from my image rather than, than enhancing it. Um, I like these particles here. So I'll colorize these particles. Like so... Maybe I'll erase this bottom bit like that. Okay, 
So once I've got this, it's starting to look kind of cool. Um, do I have anything else here before? Okay, so there's my there's my basic. That's like, okay, here we are. What do we want to do now? The next thing I want to do is I wanted to add some particles, and I found this element. It's just some particles that I found on Google. Um, the color of it's wrong, but what I like to do is, is I normally take that element. Let's do it with this original one. I'll take this guy here. I'll do Command L, and I'll pull the levels down to get rid of that color so it doesn't mix with the color I've got going on. And so now I'm just getting the particles. If I did that without, like this, watch how the, the image changes the color. And now I'm picking up all these these other tones that I don't want. So. get this guy back here I've got this going on here and then some of them are blurred and out of focus which is nice and then I will bring back some of that color so I'll duplicate this original image like so screen it turn the opacity to half and then I like it kind of on the edges, but I don't like it on my guy, so start putting it like this. So you're bringing in a little bit of that background color in? Just a little bit. Okay. Um, again, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've got three of these <coughs> same image um, layers here. It's my branch. Okay, so this is an image that I found on a Shutter account that I paid for. Because <laughs> um, I like this texture that's going on here And I would like to add it to my guy So I'm going to duplicate it I'm going to just grab this guy here Because I think it's cool I'm going to change the color Again, I'm going to just change the levels and I'm going to screen it and I'm going to see where this could live. I have no idea where this could live yet. So I'm going to start by putting it under the eye and seeing if that works. Just kind of, there we go. Now for the sake of time, you've, sort of have an idea as to where you go but if this were you working in real time this process could take a little bit longer than what we're showing you right now right because you're going to go through and you're going to try lots of different things absolutely you're going to go down a rabbit hole and then it didn't work out and you're going to come back again a lot of people watching is probably thinking well, how do you know to grab that element it's because he's tried a couple things already and we're going to save you guys a little time by just jumping into what he thinks is going to work yeah <clears throat> and also you know like i said sometimes you work on you know, you create conventions in your images. Like I look at that image here and I'm already like, okay, so this is sitting under this girl's eye. So it's going to work on my guy. So I'm just going to grab it and just hope that it works. I started to get kind of <coughs> creepy. Um, I also found this. It's just another texture. And I was gonna do the same thing with this guy here on the chest. So screen it. Just again playing with it and seeing if there's any interesting shapes. And if it could be if it could belong. Oh, what is happening here? Sorry. Rasterize, okay. This is part layer. Yeah. So maybe just kind of making it feel more of like a tribal character. I might see if I can pull some of this paint here. And maybe not. Like I would quickly just do this just to see if it fits. You know, I'm not in love with the idea, so I don't need it. Get back that image here in case I need it later, but I don't think so. So yeah this is sort of where i came came to finishing this image back at my house mm -hmm. i was like this is where i'm at with it what i did do 
was I grabbed a bunch of assets that I liked the look of. Um, I didn't have time to put them in, but I liked this. Like maybe the body could be, you know, textured this way. These were kind of cool close-ups of rocks. Um, I found this, which was really interesting, which I thought would be kind of cool that maybe there's a rip somewhere in the character's body. Um, this is something I pulled off Pinterest. I don't know where it's from, so I would actually not use it in a frame. Mm -hmm. But just for the sake of, you know, if a demo? Had, for a demo, yeah. like a technique, I figured that it, this is really interesting. So um, before I do that, let me just show you something. Whenever I finish an image, what I like to do is I like to go Command Shift Option E and I create this basically a screen grab of it at the top. Mm -hmm. This is something that a designer showed me when I first graduated and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, <laughs> what I do with it is I'm going to go to filter, other, and high pass. Mm. Oh, high pass, here it comes. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> this is one of those things that if you overdo it, it ruins your image. So what I do is I like to <clears throat> pump it up to about, about nine, which is definitely on the cusp of ruining my image. <laughs> <laughs> now... I'm going to use my best Tim Gunn impersonation and say, use it thoughtfully. Use it thoughtfully. <laughs> so once you have this image, you got to overlay. And you can, and you may look at it at first and be like, I don't see the difference. But when you turn it on and off, you know, and like, where I'll show you where it, where it works really bad. Look around the edge of the, the character's face. It's all those color burn, horrible colors. It looks disgusting. But where it works nice is on the heart where I can get some of those details. Oh, it really pops. It really pops. So think of it like if you were painting, you can just add this to your focal point. And once you get it, I erase it everywhere else. Just get rid of it here. I don't want people to focus. I, I don't need these things here popping out that much, especially up there. Just even here and then just on the heart. Mm. Would you give this guy a little light wrap since he's backlit, James? Would you, because yeah, it's a you, bright light source? Absolutely. I actually have I have these right here for that very... Here we go. Maybe I set you up for it. Yeah, let's do it. So how I would do this, I can bring this character... What? Ha where do these black bars come from? Which black bars? At the top and the bottom. Oh, I just Why turned is the head getting off. cut off? Oh, okay. Yeah. You want to letterbox it? Yeah, I mean, this was... I, I always put this in here in case to check it out, but we'll leave it. We can leave it like this. There's a lot of misconception, you guys, going on on the YouTube conversation right now. Lots of misconceptions. So why don't you go ahead and start working on that golden light or whatever you're going to do. And I'm going to bring up these questions and we can talk about it. Okay. okay. Everyone getting really angry. Well, it's just because, you know, not everybody's as educated about what it is we do in our industry. So we're going right. to try to do our best to dispel some of these myths. First of all, Matthew's already said this, but since there's still a lot of chatter going on about this, I'm gonna lay down the law right now, you guys. I'm gonna lay it down. People do not understand this thing. In the motion design industry, it's typically composed of two types of people. People who make design and frames, what, what James is doing, and the people that animate and do the compositing, so the moving parts of it, which is some something that Erica is doing. Yep. Now, there are day walkers like Blade where they do both, but it's not that common that you do both because it requires mastery of two very different disciplines. The animation part of it, which is about timing, cadence, and flow, and compositing the, all the VFX tricks that you need to know. And then there are people who do design work. So let's be clear, you can be very successful doing one or the other. Most schools try to push you out that funnel like you're a piece of sausage and scorch you out the other end and say that you do both. <laughs> I'm sorry for the metaphor. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's what I could come up with, guys. <clears throat> and then what happens is you present an animated reel that's not very good and a design reel that's not very good. <laughs> So let's just mash that misconception right now. If you're studying motion design work or you want to work in the motion design industry, first of all, God bless you. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> but you can actually just graduate and show eight to 10 storyboard comps, like the one that James is making, and get a job and do very well in life. Or you can show a killer animation reel and don't worry too much about the topography, but really bring some elements to life. You're going to do really well there as well. So that's the first part. Because people are like, oh, is he a... What are they saying, Matthew? I, I like lost track of all these no, it's, comments I think, in here. Yeah, people mm -hmm. are coming in new to the stream and don't understand that you could do both. And I think from the perspective of somebody like me, 
who's a creative director who needs to hire talent to fill my team and produce uh, a project. I look at somebody like James, who's a designer, is like, this guy can help me win the work. This guy can make a comp and image really fast and help me uh, convey the idea that's in my head in a visual format so that I could sell that to the client very quickly, you know, over a couple of days when we're in the pitch process versus somebody on the other end who's an expert animator or particle um, uh, simulator, you know, somebody like that, uh, expert compositor, like, okay, now that I've won the job, I need somebody who can create the high fidelity version of the animated uh, execution of this. That's what I'm hiring them for. Sometimes I'll get unicorns who could do both, but you know, it's very rare. And usually I compartmentalize uh, those different tasks in the project. A quick question for you from Sisse Tez. Uh, James, have you worked at the mill or MPC in London before? No, I work with the mill New York and LA all the time. Okay, beautiful. You guys normally assume British accent. Of course, he's going to work in London, but the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> did he sketch before? I don't think you did. This is your sketch. This is my sketch. Right. People don't understand that. Now, people are saying like, my God, that's a lot of work and it's very tight for a comp for an idea yeah this is another big misconception you guys in our industry in order to win a pitch or to help clients or your boss visualize an idea it's at least this tight now he's working really fast but this is the level in which you're going to need to work at if you want a job period so let's move on from that okay because somebody's like, it feels very meticulous and detailed for a comp. No, that's how it has to be. Honestly, when I when I left my computer, just checking this image this morning, I was like, I haven't, this isn't meticulous enough. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was freaking out about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But that the good thing about that is it just comes with practice. The more you are in the program, just like anything, the cleaner it gets and quicker. So. Yeah. Um, and just because several people have mentioned this, they said the lighting and the set is on point today. It looks super good. You look good. I look good. I can't say anything about Matthew and Greg and Erica. But <laughs> we look good. <laughs> James, the, why are we late? Because we want to make sure James and I look freaking beautiful. That's just the way it's going to be. So I, that's a uh. shout out to Aaron and, and Mark and, and Erica <laughs> just like getting this thing in, in shape. And there's a lot of lights. And then the question is, what camera equipment we're using? We're using the same camera equipment we've always used. It's a bunch of Canon C100s, you guys. Let's move on. Uh, somebody's throwing out a little props to James, Matt, Skills. And Thanks. Lydia is saying, to win, to win, you must make it perfect. You do. Yeah. And single image can win you a $100,000 account. Absolutely. Like, <clears throat> I mean, there's different studios do this in different ways. You know, there's a lot of um, studios will just hire me and say, we just want one really good image. And then there's other studios that will be will hire me for the same amount of times and be like, we want five. Um, I personally am a big fan of making one really good image because you know I tell my students that whenever you make a style frame, don't think that it's going to be on TV or on the internet. Think about it as if you're going to open up a magazine and it's one image to tell a story, you know? So that's why you kind of have to try and get as much information in an image and make sure it's clean and reads well. Yeah. But that's just a preference. Right. Now, those of you guys that are curious, go to jameslevydesign.com. jameslevydesign.com. Check out his work. You'll see it there. Now, it's great to make one killer image and just draw you in that's very seductive, that just gets people really excited, get all the visceral emotions and reactions going. But generally speaking, a storyboard consists of multiple frames. So James is working on an A-frame right now, but sometimes he'll produce three, five, seven, 12 frames to tell a story because we need to work through the problem. So at minimum, I'm gonna say it's like three frames, but he's yeah. gonna put the same attention to detail in three frames. Now this becomes a lot more challenging because to move the camera around, to tell a story, and to get the same feeling, the same lighting quality, that takes a lot of work because your elements are coming from all over the universe. And this is where the skill comes in. Now, I'm gonna get into a little bit of your story while you work. Can you, can you walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time? Absolutely. <clears throat> all right, here we go. If it hasn't become totally obvious to you, James is not from America. Where are you from, man? I'm from London. This is not a fake British accent. He's not trying to be more sophisticated <laughs> than uh, everybody else here, right? You dumb Americans, right? So he's from London. So when did you come to the States? Um, I moved here when I was 16 and a half, 17 years old. So you uh, moved here to go to high school then? Yeah, well, it was, it was actually really funny because my mum, and I know this is a bit of a backstory, but my mum is a twin. A twin she's a twin sister mm -hmm. and when i was born my auntie married an american and moved out here 
And then all of my family got moved out here apart from myself, my mum and my father. And we applied to become, you know, we applied for a visa when I was eight years old. And just as we were about to get the visa, 9-11 happened a couple of years later. Right. And that just closed everything down and there was a backlog. So we just forgot about it. We're like, right, we're never going to America. And then finally, one day we had an envelope with a, an American flag on it that said congratulations. And my parents left it up to me. They're like, right, do you want to move to America or do you want to stay in London? And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to go move to America and work at Pixar. That's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, this is you at 16? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. you already knew this is what you wanted to do. Well, as a kid, I didn't know I didn't know you could do anything in art. I used to okay. scribble on everything and draw on everything. And, you know, I was my parents were really worried. They're like, what's this kid going to do for a, a job? You right. know, had the attention span of a, a goldfish. And so... <laughs> I remember watching Pixar, I was watching Finding Nemo and I watched the end bit where they showed, you know, the jobs like behind the scenes. Right. And this character's drawing fish and running around. I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And so I decided to come here to do that. And as soon as I got here, I looked up schools where I could do this. I found Otis. I built a portfolio over the summer. I applied and I got in. And so I was like dead set on that. So you went to Otis and you studied, I guess you you were in the digital media program, but within that there's many different majors and, and things that you can specialize in, right? Right, and yeah. I remember when I met you, I think you were still under the concept art department, like doing matte paintings and yeah. really beautiful library. Like this is not concept art, you guys, because concept art has to be photo, photographic. Yeah, or I mean, or painted. Matte um, paintings. Yeah, I, I didn't even do start doing this until about six months af after I graduated. Um, I had no idea this was even a job. No one told me at school this was a job. There was a couple people in the department that knew about this and they knew about motion graphics and you know they were there to do motion graphics, but I didn't, I, that wasn't me. So I didn't know about this job until after I got my first job out working at a studio and they hired me for two days and I was really excited. I was like, great, I got a job. And then after two days, like, thanks for the work. Um, we'll call you when we need you. And I panicked. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And then at the time, there was a website called Motionographer that was, I remember when I graduated, I would look at it like as soon as I woke up to see what new stuff was out. Yeah. And it's still a great website and they still post amazing work. But I remember it was like a really big deal when I graduated. And they had a, a cream of the crop list. I'm going to stop for a second just because I can't multitask. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what you're they, doing to that person's shoulder. They had a cream of the crop list. Yeah. And so you had like the top five studios on there, the top five designers, etc. And I started looking at the designers and they were making style frames. And I had no idea. I had to get rid of that. It was driving me mad. Um, I had no idea that this was a job. And I found one, I found one designer who I really liked. Um, I won't say the name, but... I looked at his work. And James, I, you can tell him it's my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Come on, James, it's all right. Okay, you know, go on. There was Keep a couple guys and I, I really liked their work and I, it was just like this revolution, revelation. I was like, holy shit, holy cow. I can, <laughs> I, can go, strawberries. I can go ahead and create that. Right. And so I asked my dad for, I think I asked my dad for a thousand dollars. I was like, I need a thousand dollars for rent money and food and I will give this back to you. And, at this point, I was, you know, in so much debt from college. He was like, well, okay, here you go. And I came up with my own clients. I, I picked Rolex and I picked uh, Persil and I made my own, my own briefs and I made design frames and I built a website for a month doing style frames, um, hoping that maybe I could reach out to one of those guys that I liked on Motionographer and say, can I get some pointers? I ended up submitting my website once it was up I actually, it was funny. I had I set up a G, Gmail account. I set, I I posted my website. And I just sat in my room, like waiting for emails to come in, and nothing happened. And then I actually emailed, I think it was Justin Cohn who was running Motionographer, and I said, mm -hmm. "Hey, just started. Do you have any tips, any pointers, or what have you?" And um, the next morning, I woke up, and a friend of mine who I graduated with was like, "Hey, Motion Motionographer," and I went online, and and I I got posted said like check out my work and my website got posted and I looked at my email and I had a bunch of emails from studios wanting me to do style frames look at that and um for that first year I literally lived off those emails you know I worked everywhere 
um, even if it was for a day or people wanted me for half a day, I just, I went to work. I, I wanted to get better at this craft. And I realized, wow, this is, this is, this is a great avenue for people to go who do concept art that may not necessarily go work at a game studio or a motion graphics, um, at a animation studio, because there's a lot of work out there. Like there's this big, people believe that unless you go work at DreamWorks or Pixar, or Riot Games or these big studios that you're going to struggle, but you're not. I mean, we live in Southern California. There's hundreds and hundreds of studios that want designers. So to this day, every year when I when I update my website, I hit up Motionographer and say, hey, can you upload my work? And I, I think I got posted like four or five times. Mm. And even if, it, even if the work I'm getting is coming from that or not, I just, I feel like, you know, I, that was how I got, noticed in the beginning so yeah that's how i got into doing style frames i didn't even know it was a job until i went to a studio and realized that people did this for a living that's fantastic and you you made the jump from doing concept art into doing motion design work yeah that not many people have been able to make right yeah as far as i know because there are people who concentrate on this kind of stuff doing photo comping and it's a very specialized industry that we're in and then there's incredible matte painters who work with 3D software to build buildings and worlds, uh, mountains, landscapes, those kind of things. Yeah. This is a little different. Yeah, it is different. Yeah. Um, it's hard to make that jump. I actually hated doing concept art and I realized that just as I graduated. <laughs> I, I, I hated Good timing it. on that, Jeff. My, my I hated friend. it. I remember I was working, I was at work and the assignment was to make a spaceship and I painted a spaceship and I was super pr happy with it. And they're like, great, we need like 80 more. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. I was like, there's no way. I got to, like, I did like three or four of them. And I was like, right, I'm done. I can't, if I do any more spaceships right now, I'm going to blow my brains out. So then I realized that was the very nature of concept art. It is. And um, I was like, yeah, I'm not in for that. So I still do concept art. And I actually have another company that I'm about to launch that is all based on concept art. But it's for me personally. I don't, I won't have like a client for concept art mm. i'll do it for frames but my concept art is for me mm -hmm. but yeah that's great so jonathan has a question for you jonathan drum says if you wanted to get into exactly what you're doing how does it go about starting um <clears throat> i mean i guess now it'd be different i would just start looking at work that you like um if it be animation or commercials or even just print and just get into Photoshop and start, start, you know, playing around. I mean, I've shown you some of these, some of the um, basic techniques, cutting out photos, lighting things, um, and just practice and then build a portfolio, find stuff you like, build up the work. And then I tell all my students actually that, you know, at, I, I teach at Otis and there's a class where they have a business class and they, you know, learn how to write resumes and all of that's super valuable, obviously. But I never wrote a resume. I've never needed it. I've always found just sending in my work or walking into a studio and saying, hi, my name is James. Can I leave my work here or can I email someone? You know, everyone's super friendly and people will give you the time. If you, you know, you're always going to get out what you put in. So if you reach out to half a dozen people, and two or three of them get back to you, that's two or three people that are gonna get back to you and maybe one of them decides to have you come into the studio or yeah, just you gotta just jump on the box and create. There's no way around it. Perfect. Okay, let's, uh, are we almost done with this? And I, I, yeah. I wanna talk about a few other things, but yeah, I maybe think, answer some more questions. Yeah, I think I'm gonna just slap this box back on it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> no, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's where I am with the demo. Okay. Matthew, Greg, you guys want to say something? Any comments or questions from you guys? Yeah, I, I think um, one thing that some people are curious about now that people understand how you can get into the industry a bit. Uh, James, from your perspective, since you're working exclusively in creating stills for motion, concept art for motion, how competitive do you feel the market is? Um, there's a lot of people doing it, but at the same time, a lot of people are really bad at it. And there's a lot of people that are really good at it. You know, just like anything, you know, it's it's very saturated, but um, it's not difficult if you put the work in. You just have to sit at the box and practice. Like one thing for me is I look back at some of my old style frames and they were really, really bad. And, you know, you just, 
you just got to the, the more you do it the better you get and it and if you if you're practicing and you're getting better and you're trying to contact people and you're doing those together you know you're going to get hired someone will hire you mm-hmm. um even if it's for a day or two but then they'll call you back so yeah it's competitive i'll say this there's always room at the top you guys and if you're thinking about entering this field or any field and being mediocre at it i would devise a new game plan yeah you can get better and it's just like many things if you put the hours in you will get better probably some guidance along the way and there's a lot of resources online too on how to do this well, I think there's the like a thing. place called concept art academy there's a there's schoolism absolutely Are there are a couple other ones that you know about um you know, the, I've never looked up for style frames, but I'm in the I'm in the midst of learning 3D right now. Oh, really? Yeah. What program? Cinema 4D and then ZBrush. Mm-hmm. So you know, I feel I feel like I'm really behind on it, and I think my photo comping has got really clean over the years because I've been forced to use it. You know, um, but it's been great. Like saying that now, I'm looking back at looking at doing 3D, and I've got students that I teach that are great at 3D and I'm asking them questions and it's great because nowadays you go online, just type in tutorials and just learn, you know? Right. Everything's there for you to learn. It's just how much work you're gonna put in. Mm-hmm. I try and get like a about 45 minutes of 3D in a day and I used 3D for, for the first time in a project a couple months ago and it was terrible, but um, <laughs> I was just really amped that I made an element, you know? And so my goal is by next year is to, be able to render out a perfect still life Mm -hmm. and if i don't hit that mark i'm not going to be mad at it but i know i'm going to get pretty close so you know if that answers that question i don't know all right let's get some of the gear questions out of the way they just want need to know the gear so we're using photoshop this is the standard photoshop that you have there's no super advanced concept art version of photoshop he's using a wacom pen it's an intuos pro and we were talking before the show that you bought it a cintiq and you you still prefer the Intuos Pro for now for style frames for style frames yeah I have the 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 Centique the new tablet and mm-hmm. I use it for painting mm-hmm. I'm currently doing children's books so I'm painting with it and I love it but I can't look down at the Centique when I'm making style frames I like the old tablets yeah now the other bit too is that uh, the iPad Pro with the pencil is an amazing tool too like with a program like Procreate there's some amazing things that you can do with that as well a lot a lot of different ways to get here. What else we got, you guys? Uh, James, do you ever do remote work for other studios? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm always, I'm doing about 50% working in studio and 50% working from home. Great. And working from home is dangerous. <laughs> it's it really dangerous? dangerous. You have to be so disciplined. Like, it's very easy when you work at home to sleep in. Or, you know, take a longer lunch or eat lunch <laughs> on the couch and then you have a nap. So I make sure when I'm working from home, I'm like up and I get dressed and I lock myself at my desk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what else? Greg, you got anything you want to say? Um, one of my questions was, you know, James, you've been doing this for uh, a while now. And what, how do you continue to, to learn new things? Like it sounds like you're learning 3D, but, you know... Uh, along your path what, what have you done to, to keep evolving and, and, and keep learning new, thing, new, um, new things you know i'm learning more things as i'm changing as a human you know like i'm not i don't feel the need to necessarily learn more things to do style frames like i'm going to do style frames how <laughs> i'm going to do style frames but as my personal you know interests change or my goals change all of a sudden i'm realizing that i can't stop learning you know you have to keep learning and and that's that's like the best part of it like if you're not learning and you're sitting stale then it's just not a good way to live so yeah i'm just that's how i'm like all of a sudden my interests have changed i want to get back into doing illustration so Mm. now i'm going back and i'm watching a lot of tutorials about lighting and color and you know i'm seeking out artists that are very good illustrators and asking them what they can what i should start thinking about what you know people what um, artists i should start watching and you know as you do that you just get better at it so yeah that's how you you have to are you working on a book or something yeah yeah i've actually written six children's books this year wow yeah i'm i'm uh i'm opening a new company called james alfie which is going to be like a my pen name 
and um, I'm going to be creating children's books and learning equipment and toys and all of that stuff just on the side just because I thought it'd be kind of interesting to to switch up mm -hmm. how do you keep focused when you're working remotely like you said you had to chain yourself to the desk what what keeps <laughs> you chained there honestly I whenever I get booked on a job I make sure that my house is spotless clean I've got food in the fridge and uh, I turn my phone off. Like I actually take my phone and I, I turn it off or I put it in the other room and I just sit there and work. I tell everyone that everyone that I know I'm expecting calls from, I'm like, if I don't pick up, I'm working. And I tell my client, you know, best way to contact me is by email. And uh, yeah, I just, I just sit there and get it done. Stas Robin is asking this question. What are the difficulties in this field? Do you have any horror stories? Maybe somebody stiffed you or you thought you were booked for longer than you, you were or something weird yeah i mean i wouldn't get advice. into i wouldn't get into specifics about that mm -hmm. you know that's unprofessional but you know those situations can occur so i think that for advice to not have that happen is on the front end make sure you have in writing um in email the agreements like what are you going to get paid make sure that's agreed on make sure your booking dates are agreed on make sure that you are promising what you're delivering you can actually deliver and that's how you avoid those things. Like most of the time, if there's ever any horror stories, it's not intentional. It's just maybe miscommunication. And that can be with one one of the two parties not covering their self. So you haven't been burned by a studio that was borderline going bankrupt and just never wound up paying you? Um, no. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there, 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 there was a couple of times where I had late payments yeah. and... You know, it's just it's just part of it. It's, it's weird. It's, it's a weird thing to talk about, you know, because it's it, I don't I don't want to be unprofessional and start telling horror stories, but leave that part up to me. Yeah, I would be the unprofessional person to tell the horror story. Yeah, but you just have to make sure. I've what I have realized is that those horror stories cease to happen if you just you know make sure that you cover yourself with what you agree that you're going to do on. Make sure the price is agreed on and the time and if you're working at a studio you can avoid those horror stories by excuse my language but not being a dick it's very hard to get fired in our industry <laughs> <laughs> no I, I think it can be pretty easy <laughs> you think so? i mean i found that you know as long as you promise what you can actually deliver and you are a nice person and you work well and you'll be okay right you can avoid the horror story if you go to a place that I, be, I can tell you this, I've worked at places and after being there for a couple of days, I very quickly realized, you know what, this isn't an environment for me. Mm -hmm. And I just finish up my booking and whenever they contact me again, I'm, I'm just I'm just not available. Like a true professional. You have to be. You know, the Brits are so professional. <laughs> it's or at got least nothing they sound to do like they're that. very professional. It's got Leave nothing to, the to do with that. Americans like, I'm out of here. F yeah. you guys on the way Don't out. Don't get me wrong, there's definitely been some studios where it's been mental, but you right. know, you realize very quick this is a very small industry mm -hmm. and your reputation is everything. And right. so. So here's how to sum that up. Do or say what you do and then do what you say and don't be a crazy person mm. and you're going to get booked. If you put the time and energy and effort into this, developing your craft, just like everything else, whether it's graphic design, web design, UX, or concept art or style frame design, you'll get work. Yeah. You'll get work. And you got you to gotta learn how to let people know who you are. So back in the day, I guess you, me, a lot of people in our industry owe a lot to Justin Cohn and Motionographer because for a time, that was the source for anything related to motion design. So if you were featured, if you popped up on their stream, that meant a lot of people were gonna be now aware of you. Absolutely. You were able to break through, that's awesome. I'm gonna take one last question here, you guys. One last question, and here we go. It's gonna come from Marcus. How are you usually briefed what does the briefing on a project look like? Because this is purely uh, an exercise that you showed us. This the man, the, the the dark tribal man with golden lips and and a heart of rose or whatever. Yeah, rose heart. Typically, what did the parameters sound like? What do you? What kind of objective are you trying to solve? <clears throat> well, that's like a loaded question because there's there's definitely a that's why we end on those. Yeah, Just so. Say the question is about the brief, like how do you now get How do you briefed? get briefed? Like if we 
the blind or the mill or a brand new school brings you in, so gives you a, okay. a brief, what, what does it sound like? So normally when you get a brief, um, you get a PDF and it's being given from the client to that's gone to the eight, to an ad agency that has then been given to a production house. Usually it has their statement, their product, what they want. It's very open-ended, but what I always focus on is the reference images that they send. They send references of stuff they like and stuff they don't like, mm -hmm. and they give you a story. So once you get that brief, then you have to, you have to look at style frames that you're problem solving and you have to take your ego out of it. Um, I tell all my students, like, if you're going to work professionally as an artist, make sure you have something on the side, even if it's just an Instagram account where you can paint to get your, I don't know, I guess, what would you call it? Like your, <clears throat> your creative, I don't know, like, because when you get the brief, you, you're basically, you've got to take your ego out of it. I don't mm -hmm. know any other way to say it. Mm -hmm. So when you get that brief, you have to problem solve, like, okay, this is what they want. I'm going to get this done and try and stay as much on task as getting what the client wants done. Um, but normally that's what you get. You get a bunch of words, a script, some storyboards, and uh, you're off to the races. Excellent. You know, it's about that time. It's about one o'clock. And first of all, I want to thank you for coming into the studio. And I want to thank you guys that are watching this show today for hanging in there with us and for uh, dealing with the tardiness. But at least you guys know his mic sounds good. The lighting on James and I are, are good. And we also got as a bonus thing, both Matthew and Greg in on the show today. So I'm gonna wrap it up, you guys. Thanks very much for tuning in. Remember, Thank you're you. not defined by your past. The future is what you make it. And we're gonna go out on that. So if people wanna get in touch with you, James, here's your information. Send questions to James via James Levy Design on Instagram, Instagram only. He has a Twitter account, but he hardly ever uses it. So Didn't know I had it. Yeah, he hasn't posted a single thing. And then also, if you wanna find out more about James's work, if you wanna book him, if you wanna talk to him about his book, or you wanna help him, whatever it is, jameslevydesign.com. And that's it. On behalf of the entire team, I'm going to say goodbye.